I want to thank you for inviting me to talk, and I'm excited to talk about this today. So it's, uh, it's obviously there's a lot of interest in this. Um, so yes, I'm at the, from at the University of Buffalo. I have a bit of an interesting practice in terms of MIS uh, surgery, but also um, advanced endoscopy. So kind of a different perspective sometimes. So um, these are my disclosures. So I'm not going to go through a ton of like a clandogram stuff because we just went over that. But in terms of why we even want to consider this, I think there's been a lot of data showing why this is beneficial to consider. Um, I know the paradigm has usually traditionally been um, whenever we can suspect cholelithiasis, getting an MRCP or doing an ERCP prior to cholecystectomy. But I think there's a lot of evidence showing that doing a single stage approach has a lot of benefits. So it leads to shorter hospitalization just because you're not doing an ERCP, waiting a day, and then doing a cholecystectomy. It means fewer procedures. That means that you're having a shorter length of stay. That means it's more cost effective both for um, the patient itself, um, having less procedures, less staffing, as well as a, a shorter length of stay. And it actually has been demonstrated that it has a similar efficacy and similar complication rates compared to a pre- or post-operative ERCP, and that success can be up to 75%. So I think there's a lot of evidence demonstrating that doing this all in a single-stage approach is something that we really should consider in everyone's practice. So I'm not going to go over a ton of this just because we just went over that in the previous talk, but in terms of when we should consider doing a CBD expiration, um, I think there's some certain sort of intraoperative factors that you need to consider in terms of the number of stones, the size and location of these stones um, in, rel in relation to the anatomy that you see in terms of the cystic duct, the hepatic, uh, common bile duct, as well as the hepatic ducts. Um, I think it was covered nicely in the previous talk, so I'm not going to go too far into this, uh, but especially if you're new to this, I think these are very important factors to consider because uh, you don't want to be tackling a really hard uh, transistic CBD expiration as your first case. So in terms of when we should do this, I think any patient that has cholelithiasis, any abnormal LFTs, there's a concern for cholelithiasis, as we mentioned before. I think you should always consider uh, doing a cholangiogram at the very least. Um, and then when you see that on the cholangiogram, I think it's always good to consider doing a CBD expiration at the same time. Um, so in terms of intraoperative factors that can sort of influence your decision, um, especially if you're very new to doing this, you want to sort of look at where the stone is in relationship to, um, in, to in relationship to the common bile duct. So if it's distal to the cystic duct common bile duct junction, how, how big that cystic duct diameter is, um, as well as the size of the stones. Um, we're going to go through sort of troubleshooting if the stones are larger than that or if the cystic duct is smaller, but um, we just, this is just tips to sort of make it easier, especially if you're new to starting out, is starting with smaller stones, um, having uh, a cystic duct that's straight and lateral, obviously are all factors that um, make it easier for you to do your case. And on the flip side, I guess I gotta use this. Um, these are more relative contraindications, but if you have a patient that's very septic, um, hypotensive, um, tachycardic, intubated pressors, it may not necessarily be a good first case for you to be doing a CBD expiration. Sometimes that, it, obviously with a CBD expiration, does require a little bit of longer operative time, so that may not necessarily be the case that you want to do this. Um, if there's any concern that there may be a concomitant malignancy, also want to consider um, maybe doing an ERCP instead. But again, I think a lot of the times you can consider doing this um, through a transistic CBD expiration. So it's on the flip side of the indications. Um, so you have multiple stones. It's not to say that you can't do it. It certainly is possible, um, but maybe not necessarily be the first case you want to tackle. If they're big stones, we're going to talk about how we can troubleshoot in terms of doing lithotripsy and other talks. I'm not going to go over that, but if the it's going to be easier if the stones are smaller. And if the stones are bigger, you just want to consider that the cystic duct may not necessarily be the, the proper diameter, and you may risk tearing the, the cystic duct common bile duct junction that may uh, require repair. So these are just sort of relative contraindications. It's not that you can't do it. It's more things that um, can make your, make the case a little bit more challenging. Obviously, if the cystic duct insertion site is more medial um, or, it, or closer, or, or the stones are, are proximal to the cystic duct common bile duct junction, it may be more challenging to go into the intrahepatics. So again, you can't really be tackling, those are not really ones that you want to be tackling on this approach. 
So I think the first step to this is always considering flushing. A lot of the stones that we see, sometimes they're only three or four millimeters, and those can easily flush, and you don't need to be doing a ton of instrumentation. So through the cholangiogram catheter that you already have, it's always useful to flush first with uh, sterile normal saline. Up to You can do up to 60 cc's. Um, and I think a useful adjunct into this is giving glucagon. We do this routinely for ERCPs to relax the sphincter of OD, and that can actually help a lot of the stones pass. So I think that's always a good first step before you think about doing more advanced techniques, which we're gonna go over in the next slide. But that's always a good first step is to start with this. So in terms of what, we, what tools we need, um, I think we kind of went over this part um, with the previous talk, but just always uh, in terms of tools, you wanna think about what guide wires you need um, in terms of an 035 hydrophilic guide wire, um, using a 10 French flexible introducer sheath that allows for you to place your coelidocoscope through it. Um, so there's always just size considerations in terms of uh, what you need. And as we mentioned, an Olson reddit clamp, it's, it helps you out. It doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily need it, but it's a useful tool so that you don't, um, you don't need to use another port um, or go through a separate site. So in terms of how we obtain the wire to access, I think we kind of went through this, but in brief, um, essentially you're threading the guide wire through your cholangiogram catheter. Um, you wanna put the wire as far distal as possible into the duodenum. The farther that you get it, um, you want to, it helps you maintain your wire access. You don't wanna lose it. Um, once you get it, it can be quite challenging sometimes. Um, so you do wanna keep this in place, and essentially use a cell denture technique to, go thing, um, to remove the cholangiogram catheter over the guide wire, and then go over the wire to insert new tools. So I think it, these are things that all of us are quite familiar with. It's just learning how to do this. Um, and you just, in terms of the sheath itself, um, you don't want to be placing the sheath directly into uh, the ductotomy. It's just to place just um, outside of that. It just helps to prevent any uh, leakage or bowing of the instrument. So it's mostly um, just to help you facilitate instrument exchange. So in terms of cystic duct dilation, um, I don't. I, I will say we don't necessarily have to do this step. It ultimately depends on your cystic duct. A lot of the time, the stones obviously went through the cystic duct into the common bile duct and they were already a certain size. It dilates the cystic duct already. So it's not a step that's absolutely necessary, but it's just something to consider. If there's a lot of valves, um, if it's tortuous, it might just help to um, sort of make it a little bit wider or help facilitate stone extraction. But a lot of the time, um, this may not necessarily be a, a, a necessary step, but just something to keep in mind. In terms of um, what we do, um, you, as um, Dr. Jackson mentioned, you do want to compare the cystic duct diameter in relation to the stone itself as well as the common bile duct. And uh, you don't want to dilate it too much either. You don't want to risk sort of uh, causing a, a tear at the cystic duct common bile duct junction that makes it harder for you to repair afterwards. And you don't really want to dilate it too much, um, far, far greater than two millimeters or di uh, wider than the common bile duct itself. Um, in terms of what you need, um, these are all in the kits, and I'll show you a few examples of the kits, but this is the, essentially the balloon that it, it can be used. Um, it has radio opaque markers on either side, so you can actually see it under uh, fluoroscopy. You do want to use the balloon with dye, so you can actually see the whole balloon inflate, um, so, and, and you do need a pressure injector actually to dilate the balloon itself. So in terms of how we do it, I don't know. I'm just gonna let this run while we do this. But you do want, everything is passed over the guide wires. You're pass, essentially going, um, passing the balloon dilator over the guide wire into the cystic duct. You do wanna span the entire cystic duct common bile duct junction um, and in, inflate it with contrast under fluoroscopy so you can actually see the full dilation effect. You're actually combining this with your laparoscopic view as well. Um, in terms of how much atmospheres, it all, every, every balloon's a little bit different, uh, but you can, it, it's all depending on the manufacturer guidelines. Um, but you hold it in place for up to five minutes. Um, but again, what you need to worry about sometimes, especially if you di over dilate, is that you don't want to be, uh, you don't want to be tearing um, the cystic duct, uh, common bile duct junction. Another way that you can do this is um, doing it all under fluoroscopy. Um, so if you don't necessarily have a coelidogoscope, which I'm, I'm gonna go over that as well later, these are some of the tools that you can use um, if you don't have a coelidogoscope readily at your disposal. Everything can be passed over the guide wire. So you can use a Fogarty balloon, which is what the vascular surgeons use, um, usually a four to six French, or you can use a tip basket. So this basket has fluoroscopic markers and you can use that under fluoroscopy to capture the stones. 
So in terms of the Fogarty balloon, it's quite similar to what we all probably saw in, in our vascular, um, vascular rotations in terms of doing an embolectomy. You're passing this balloon um, under fluoroscopic visualization, um, passing it past the stone, inflating the balloon and pulling and withdrawing the catheter with the stone out of your cystic duct orifice. So that's a useful tool. I mean, it, it's something that a lot of hospitals um, have. So it's something that just to consider doing this approach as well. And then if you have the basket, um, it's quite useful as well. Um, it also ultimately depends on your comfort levels um, in terms of visualizing this under fluoroscopy, but you can use the basket under fluoroscopic visualization, um, pull, use the basket, to open the basket, bas um, just pistol to the stone and pull it back and, jig and essentially uh, jiggle the stone into uh, your basket and withdraw it all in one unit. How do you know if you've got the stone? You can see it under fluoroscopy sometimes. Sometimes that can be difficult because of the wire baskets, so you can actually can feel it by uh, tactile sensation if the stone, if the, if the basket it doesn't close completely, you can feel some resistance and that's when you know you've gotten the stone. Um, we're going to show some videos of how, what that actually looks like under visualization, but these are just other ways that you can do this. But doing, using a cholidocoscope is probably the best way uh, to you actually directly visualize all the stones. You can confirm your clearance um, and you can actually have a great accuracy because you're actually seeing it in real time as opposed to the fluoroscopic way. So in terms of how we insert the cholidocoscope, you, you can use it, you can either do it freehand in terms of good guiding it um, with the grasper, you just have to be sure that you use a padded grasper to do this just because you don't want to be ruining the scope, uh, but you feed the wire through the distal end of the cholidocoscope working channel and advance it through the ductotomy. I realize I'm going really slow. Um, but you can either also do it uh, with the wire, but you just have to make sure that once you put this over the wire to remove the wire once in your common bile duct, just because you won't be able to have full uh, range of the scope motion with the wire in place. You do want to use saline irrigation continuously. It helps with your visualization, um, just because uh, the bile can be uh, quite viscous and impair your visualization if you don't use the saline. And then you can see that's what the stone looks like. Um, so now we're gonna go through um, how we actually extract the stone once we see it. Um, these are the different tools and um, kits that we that are available for use. Um, but uh, I just wanted to show what those look like. They all come packaged together, so that's always a plus, so you don't have to be searching for all the little individual pieces. So in terms of what it looks like, so I, I mentioned doing it fluoroscopically. This is how you actually see it under visualization. You pass the, the basket, pass the stone, and you can actually see it being captured. Um, but you can see that it, it does require a little bit of maneuvering, a, a, a sort of like a jiggling technique just to pull the stone into the basket, and then you pull all of that in one, um, as one unit. Um, I'm just, for interest of time, I'm gonna go a little bit quickly. Uh, but you essentially pull this whole coleidoscope with the stone all in one unit. So interconfirm clearance, it's always important. You can do this through, uh, do it with your cholidocoscopy, but it's always important to do it through a cholangiogram as well, just to make sure there's no leak or contrast extravasation following that. And just because the cystic duct has probably been dilated through a lot of instrument exchanges, it's, it's important to consider using a cystic uh, endo loop afterwards to ligate it to prevent leaks. So if you can't cons uh, get the stones out, I think we're gonna go through this in other, um, other talks, but you can consider lithotripsy. Um, and if the stones are too large, um, after that, you can always consider using a clangerium catheter in the cystic duct stump and exteriorizing that to prevent um, biliary obstruction. Um, there is a, a, a transcystic common bile duct stent, but I, I think I, real I, um, I recently found out that's no longer under production at this point. Um, so that's just something that was available, but we, got, we do have other ways that we can do that. We have ERCP tools that can kind of do something similar. Um, you can always consider an intra- or post-operative ERCP if you're, as, as a last um, resort, but the ultimate last resort is doing a trans doco approach um, just because it has higher morbidity or mortality, but that being said, it, it can be also done. Uh, but this is a good first step. So I just wanted uh, to finish off. I'm sorry for going a little over. <laughs> 